understand that. Stop, wait a minute, stop it! Money and force seems to be what you Ewings understand the best. From one of the worst episodes of the season to one of the best. If he doesn't do something, the Ewing family is going to control everyone and everything. The Ewing Oil Cabal needs to discuss... Wait, we'd better recap this one. The Ewings are a powerful independent oil family who had a stranglehold on the Texas state legislature thanks to their connection to state senator Wild Bill Orloff. In the season one episode Spy in the House, J.R.'s secretary Julie Gray snuck an important red file to Cliff Barnes as a way to get back at J.R. for mistreating her. The red file showed improper payments between the Ewings and Orloff, but the Ewings were able to avoid prosecution by throwing Orloff to the Wolves. The Wolves in this case being Cliff Barnes' as special prosecutor. Orloff's appointed replacement Glenn Cochran died at some point prior to old acquaintance, so Cliff announced his candidacy for the open seat. Glenn Cochran died. That's uh, probably the first decent thing he's ever done for the taxpayers. I'm gonna run for the state senate. He opened his campaign headquarters in Double Wedding, and that gets us to where we are now. The Ewing oil cabal needs to discuss their choice in beating Cliff Barnes. Since Runaway had a subplot about J.R. mending fences between Congressman Oates and their choice Slade, so that Slade would be a stronger candidate, I'm just gonna go ahead and pretend that the events of Runaway were all a bad dream. Oh what, so it's only okay when they do it? They cycle through some also-rans and bust Bobby's balls for being married to Cliff's sister before finally landing on Martin Cole, a boring but clean conservative lawyer. The boys are a little uneasy about Bobby handling Cole's campaign given his marriage to Pamela, but Jock gives him the vote of confidence. Meanwhile, Cliff is offended that the big oil companies have come calling with donations to his campaign since he's an environmentalist. They like how he's taken it to the independent oil companies like Ewing Oil, but he says he's just opposed to big oil as he is independence. None of this means that the Barnes campaign is flush with cash or anything, so Cliff recruits Pamela to run a fundraiser fashion show. Pam is hesitant, but Cliff tells her that the Ewings are rich enough to buy the seat out from under him if he can't get on TV. The Ewings, of course, are grumpy about Pam's involvement doing anything more than stuffing envelopes. JR questions Bobby's loyalty, but makes sure to tell Pam that Bobby is the one handling the fundraising for Cliff's opponent. Yeah, thanks for that, John Ross. Pam and Bobby finally have the knockdown drag out that has been building for a while. Bobby thinks that the Ewings are well within their rights to run a candidate that will cater to their interests, and Pamela thinks that Cliff is the only thing that stands between them and total domination of Texas. Bobby gives Pam the pat speech about his daddy built an empire because he worked harder and smarter than the next guy, and how anyone in America could do the same thing if they just work hard enough. Look, my daddy built an empire here because he was smarter than the next guy, and he worked harder, and he was luckier. But anybody with the same qualifications can do the same thing. Okay, can we take a moment to point out the sheer lack of self-awareness Bobby exhibits in making the bootstrap argument during a discussion that started with him openly supporting a senator whose job it is to cut off the bootstraps of anyone who gets in the Ewing's way? Everything between you and me has been done with a handshake anyway. It used to be we could count on you to keep things bottled up forever. You used your muscle for us. Slade's a good man, Bobby. He does what he's told. Look, my daddy built an empire here because he was smarter than the next guy and he worked harder and he was luckier. But anybody with the same qualifications can do the same thing. That is some deep capitalist fetishism infecting Robert Ewing's brain there. He does accurately hip-check Pamela's argument that Cliff is just looking out for the little guy, though, and makes the point that they didn't get to choose their sides. This time they were born into them. The Daughters of the Alamo sponsor a debate between Cliff and Cole. We join in the middle of Cole's closing remarks in which he makes the standard conservative anti-tax speech and quotes Jesus, saying, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's, and let man keep what is rightfully his own. Okay, second sidebar. Normally I'd leave this for the review part of the video, but it's just too relevant here in light of the way the last two scenes are stacked on top of each other. I have no idea whether writer of the episode Rena Down intended this, or whether it was just happenstance. But this is my video, so we're going down this rabbit hole she unearthed. 
The render unto Caesar phrase is an oft abused line from the Synoptic Gospels in which Jesus was pressed by hostile interrogators on whether the Jews should pay taxes to Roman authorities. They expected that Jesus would oppose taxes and in doing so would incriminate himself in the eyes of Pontius Pilate, the tax collector of Roman Judea. Instead, Jesus asks them to produce a denarius, or tribute penny. The coin is generally agreed to show Roman ruler Caesar Augustus Tiberius on one side and Pax, the goddess of peace, on the reverse. The propagandistic symbolism should be obvious. The denarius given to Caesar's kingdom is the price for living in a peaceful world. According to the apocryphal Gospel of Thomas, Jesus finishes the line very similarly to how Cole imagines he would, saying, Render unto me things that are mine. And out of context, it's very easy to read a libertarian anti-tax position into Jesus' words. However, in the full context of the story, the reason Jesus asks for the coin is to illustrate that the coin bears the image and inscription of Caesar, therefore marking it as Caesar's, and points out that those who accepted possession in the first place have already agreed to accept the benefits of belonging to Caesar's kingdom. So according to Jesus, if you choose to accept the benefits of living in a society that offers peace through law and order, you can't very well refuse when the law and order applies to you, even if it is through taxes. <laughs> And that brings us back to Pamela and Bobby. Pamela gleefully accepted the nice new Corvette and black market baby. She happily lives a life where her leisure time is so overwhelming that she gets to have a job just to pass the time while others could actually use that job to make ends meet. And it was a job she was only turned on to because she could afford to patronize the store in the first place. And it's these very connections that allow her to run a successful fundraising fashion show. In other words, Pam has already agreed to live in Caesar's kingdom, but she protests the way that Caesar built the kingdom she enjoys. Again, probably just a coincidence, but I'm going to choose to believe that Rena Down did that intentionally. My house, my rules. Back to our show. Sue Ellen gets caught creeping on Cliff in the mirror in a really cool Hitchcockian shot. Kudos to director Barry Crane on that one. Sue Ellen flirts with Cliff some more before he has to run off in glad hand. I didn't know you were interested in politics. <laughs> well, I'm not, but uh, certain politicians interest me a lot. J.R. and Jock are frustrated that Cole isn't making any progress in the campaign because he's so boring. Jock tells him to buy more ad time, hire a more aggressive speechwriter, and get a makeover. Cole is resistant at first, but J.R. reminds him who is paying for the campaign. The Ewing boys come to the realization that Cole can't win, so they're going to have to make sure that Cliff loses. Jock tells J.R. to come up with a scandal. That night at dinner, J.R. tries to create a scandal out of whole cloth by implying that Cliff and his campaign manager are homosexuals. Pamela, who can never resist the bait, says that Cliff was once engaged to be married before his fiancée died. That's enough to put J.R. and Jock on the scent. The next day, Cliff is ambushed by the press, who badger him about his fiancée's death during a botched abortion. Cliff is, understandably, caught like a deer in the headlights. He gathers the troops and tells them about the abortion, which was pre-Roe v. Wade, so it was illegal at the time. He says he kept it a secret because her family was highly religious and he didn't want to tarnish her memory. Cliff's attention turns to who could possibly have let the Ewings know. Sue Ellen runs into him, but refuses to rat out Pam. Good for Sue Ellen. Pam, meanwhile, storms the Ewing building and threatens both J.R. and Jock. I don't know how to play by your rules, but someday I will, and you're going to pay for what you've done to my brother. Jock shrugs it off as just politics, and J.R. tells Pam that if she ever did find a way to power... You won't use any of those rules against me or any other Ewing. You'll do just as we do. You'll use them to protect your own interests. She heads over to Cliff and admits that she accidentally let it slip. Cliff thinks she did it to save her marriage and refuses to hear her out. You live with vipers, you become a viper. That night, Bobby plays Ewing apologist with Pam and basically reiterates Jock's position that all is fair in war and politics. I wanted to take a real good look and see if it was worth marrying into the Ewing family. Cliff, of course, gets slaughtered in the election, leading to a rare moment of commiseration between Pam and Sue Ellen. I'm just sorry that the best man lost. And I was just thinking how nice it would have been if JR didn't get what he wanted. For once. Cliff still won't forgive Pam, so Bobby drags her over so they can all have a chat. Bobby clues Cliff in that Pam just let it slip that Cliff was engaged and JR did the rest. After Pam and Bobby leave, Cliff calls up the big oil man from the beginning of the episode and lets him know that he's finally ready to sell out. Ask him if he's got enough money to buy the next state senate seat. I've just become a realist. Damn. 
this was an excellent episode. Where to start? Where to start? Um, well, obviously, this is the big sea change episode for Clifford Barnes. After everything that has been done to him, this is the act that breaks Cliff's soul. Prior to this, he was the left-of-center social justice crusader just trying to keep the Ewings in check. I spent a lot of time lately fighting the small independent oil company, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to hop in bed with the big guys. Sure, he occasionally used and stepped on people in the name of his crusade, but it was something he believed in. Wait a minute, we can still do this because you still have access to the files. Oh, Cliff. From here on out, it's a scorched earth, drop the gun, grab the cannoli, bankrupt the Ewings at all costs vendetta. This is the Shakespeare in a 10-gallon hat drama I subscribe to the show for. What you did is unforgivable. It's hard to imagine now with Roe v. Wade so ingrained in our national discourse, but this was just five years after that landmark ruling legalized abortion in the United States. Of course, for many, this is a religious issue, so it wouldn't have mattered which side of the Roe v. Wade ruling Penny's death fell on when it came to their vote. But it is an interesting time capsule, considering how abortion would be treated in media for the next 30 years. There isn't much else to say about this episode other than it really flows well. It's both funny and infuriating to see the future state senator being bullied around by the Ewings and how to run his campaign. Which speechwriter to hire and what clothes to wear. We all know that there are politicians who are bought and paid for, but this episode lays that fact on thick. If I had one gripe, it's that the episode is a bit too compressed. The Ewings pick their candidate at the beginning of the episode and the full campaign happens over 44 minutes. This feels like something that could have been a bit more drawn out, and certainly would if the show was written today. The other issue I had is that the scandal that brings Cliff down, while timely, feels a bit too convenient. Pamela gets goaded into revealing that fact way too easily for someone who showed the savviness to outwit a blackmailer just a few episodes prior. That's a minor point though. This episode is Dallas at its early best. So long Cliff, we hardly knew you. Hey there! This is good old JR. Now I just bet you've been enjoying these here videos and now I have a favor to ask of you. And you know J.R. Ewing makes good on his favors. If you could just scroll down a little and hit that subscribe, I bet you'd feel a whole lot better about yourself. Oh, and uh, click on the bell too. I would hate for you to miss anything.